Yo. Hi. Welcome, Pete and Katie. Um, hey, everyone. Super excited to have you here today. We're going to give folks just a couple of minutes to trickle in. Um, but as a reminder, you're here for a side chat with Kevin, Katie, Dorsey. Um, before we get started, we'd love to hop into a little icebreaker with Pete and Kevin. Um, let's go with a hot topic right now, vacation. Uh -oh. I feel like everyone's traveling to super cool places. I swear there's like dozens well, and dozens I will disappoint of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, where's the next vacation? Ke Kevin. Uh Or Pete, <laughs> yeah, who Katie, wants to you're, off. Okay. you're first. This is, what, so, this is tough when you have kids, but I'm yeah. maybe Katie's got something up his sleeve. So I, I, got, I got one coming up here. So I'm going to Dublin for Sastock in October. What? And oh. it's, it's one of the events that I've wanted to speak at for a long time. Finally, made yeah. it happen. So I'm speaking it in Dublin. And I surprised oh, wow. my girls that they're coming with. And so I love uh, the that. first, like, you know, two days, like I'm speaking, doing that, which also is fun because my, my, my wife, my daughters have never seen this. They've never seen me present. They've never been to a conference before. And so they're going to get to see me do what I do. And then we're spending the rest of the week in, um, it's called Ashford Castle. It's like the 700 year old castle, like the middle of Ireland. What? So that's, that's happening in actually about a month and a half from now. So very oh, exciting. Man. That is that is badass. They've never seen like KD go full goblin mode, huh? No, I, they've, they've never seen. They've gotten a taste because now they can hear it. At can home. hear it? <laughs> right? They can they can hear it, but they've never seen it on on stage before. And so live and um, live and direct. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Um, gosh, for us, I think um, it's funny. Like I'm in Seattle right now, just like visiting a bunch of Atrium customers and like you know visiting partners and what have you. But I think actually our next like family trip is going to be to Seattle because my wife's um. Mm. My wife's brother just moved to Seattle, which is funny because like it's September right now and it's like gorgeous here. Like you're walking on the waterfront. You're like, wow, this is amazing. You should move here. And everyone you talk to is just like, yeah, just wait until October 15th. It's the, it's the cutoff date. It's when the clouds <laughs> descend. They don't lift. They don't lift until May. So we'll see if we're going to be able to like slide in under the uh, under the under the wire there. What about you, Han? You gonna you got anything cool coming up? Actually, you just had something really cool, right? Yeah, I don't have any. I actually was just talking to uh, Nopal, our marketing lead, uh, about this yesterday. I have another vacation planned yet, but soon to be. But this last weekend, I went, um, I spent Labor Day weekend on a loading campsite in a lake. Adelaide it was really cool. Um, so it was like on a little camping island on a lake all weekend. Very fun. Highly recommend. It's like a um, houseboat where there's no but, house. Yeah, exactly. And you just like, like put your tents up. Yeah, imagine like the, a houseboat that's like the size of a houseboat but instead of there being like walls and stuff it's just like the structure like the frame oh, yeah. and then you like pitch tents on it it's pretty amazing <laughs> it, was, it was really fun and then you like rent a boat so you do all the boat things um I, however like when i did go to bed when i got home my bed was like definitely still swaying i was like oh god <laughs> <laughs> um anyways Love let's go ahead and get started excited i right. loved hearing about all your vacation plans but <laughs> um we're here to talk about Sales, modern sales leadership with Kevin Dorsey today. Um, super excited for the amazing content and learnings that you're going to get out of this event. Um, today's event is brought to you by the Modern Sales Pros team. For those of you not familiar, Modern Sales Pros is the world's largest and highest quality community for people in sales management, sales leadership, sales and revenue operations, and sales enablement, aka our Modern Sales Pros. MSP's mission is to create an environment for members to answer questions they'd otherwise struggle to solve on their own and help them see around corners they may not know about. MSP does that through live sessions, an online forum, quarterly summits. We're just starting to get back to in-person events. We actually have uh, our first Dreamforce happy hour in two years coming up in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Kevin, are you going to be we here don't. for Dreamforce? I, I'm not doing it this uh, year. I've, been, like, I've traveled too much for a road fair. show earlier. Careful. Double, so I got to be, you know, I'm out. I'm out this year. I'm out. Okay. I respect be, be, that. Careful. Ben, Benioff may hear that and just be like, and, and turn off your Salesforce logins. It, it, I wouldn't mind that for a little bit. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't threaten me with a good time. Yeah, right? oh, I can't get in? Yes. 
<laughs> Whoops. Um, I just dropped the link for Dreamforce uh, Happy Hour sign up. And then um, also coming up in just a couple of weeks is MSP's next virtual summit. So if you like the content for today, That's you're going badass. to be obsessed with the content for MSP's Rev Fest Revenue Excellence Summit. We're calling it the Virtual Festival for Sales Nerds. Um, join us October 11th through 13th. We've pulled together 24 amazing with speakers like the CEO of um, Zoom Info, Gainsight, uh, leading partner at Cowboy Ventures, folks from Winning by Design. I think Winning by Design CEO, right? Mm -hmm. Is yep. going to be on that. Dominique. Yep. yep. Dominique. Um, folks from Lattice, Pendo Outreach, Atrium, and so many others. Don't wait. Definitely register for that right now. Just going to drop the link in the chat. I'm, um, I'm super pumped about what, what Dominique is going to talk about because you know, even though like winning by designs, people think about like winning by designs as being like a sales consultancy and what have you, like Dominic actually comes from a customer success background, um, which I think is like super important because at this point, like sales success, it's like, it's not the funnel, it's the bow tie, right? Which is, yeah. and so like having a success mindset, even like from the very, very top of the funnel, or I guess the left of the bow tie is just like, that's a modern way of thinking about it. And like, she's obviously like fantastic at that. So I'm, I'm pumped to see what she's going to, she's going to drop the knowledge that she's going to drop at the, uh, at the festival. Uh, yes. Couldn't agree. More. Um, so sign up for that link is in the chat. And with that, I'm going to let Pete say a few words about Atrium, our sponsor for today's event. Yeah, for sure. So for folks who are not familiar with Atrium, Atrium makes data-driven sales management software. Uh, it's software that helps sales managers, sales leaders, and reps use metrics to improve um, to improve performance. And what's so rad about one of the particularly rad things about Atrium is it's very quick to set up. It takes about five minutes to just like turn on a free Atrium account by connecting to your, uh, uh, through a read-only connection to your Salesforce account and press the change though, you'll have a world-class metrics harness that will tell you immediately, you know, what's going good and what's going not so good across dozens and dozens of KPIs for every rep in your, um, on your, in your sales organization. So that's a, uh, that's a little bit about uh, Atrium. I think we have some housekeeping before we kind of like get into our modern sales leadership topics that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I've got like two more sentences and then the mm. show is yours. Um, so just before we get started, a couple housekeeping notes. Please use the Q&A panel and the chat. It's interactive. You can re react with emojis in Goldcast, unlike Zoom. You can send gifts to Giphys. Um, and you yeah. can upvote and respond to other attendees' questions as well. So engage, have fun, um, interact. Kevin might, might respond in the chat. Um, and this is being recorded. So <laughs> if you're lucky, love that. Um, this panel is being recorded and uh, everything will be, email be made available after the event. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and head off stage and let Kevin and Pete introduce themselves and run the show from here. Lovely. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll just get myself out of the way really quickly since you're the guest of honor here, Katie. But my name is Pete Kazanji. As noted earlier, I'm one of the founders of, of Atrium. Um, I also run our go-to-market uh, organization. Uh, prior to Atrium, I started another software company called Talentbin. Talentbin was a recruiting software company that was acquired by Monster Worldwide in 2014. So it's a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But that's kind of like where I first got familiar with and started kind of like going on my modern sales journey, if you will. So I was our, you know, I was a business general founder, our first rep, uh, first sales manager, sales leader. And then when we were acquired by Monster, I was responsible for new product sales at, um, at Monster. Also wrote a book on startup sales called Founding Sales. Uh, and then started this little thing called uh, called MSP, so Modern Sales Pros. So that's a little bit, bit about me. I've been doing sales leadership stuff for about a, like about a decade now, not nearly as uh, long as KD. So KD, maybe you can tell folks a little bit about yourself, what you're working on right now, and like maybe a little background on on yourself so they, they know that they should be sitting up straight and paying attention. <laughs> uh, no, no one should pay attention to me. I'm not going to try to convince <laughs> of that. Um, but Kevin Dorsey, um, everybody calls me KD. Unless I get out of line, then call me Kevin. Then I know it's serious. I see you, Eddie. What up, my man? Um, so I've been building startup sales teams for the last decade. Um, I am the builder. That's what I do is I like to go in with five people, 10 people and build it to a hundred 
like 150, 170 person org in very short periods of time. And so I've uh, mm-hmm. done that now four times. I've got two unicorns under the belt now um, with Service Titan and with Patient Pop at now a Tebra company. So, you know, I've been doing a lot of scaling over the past 10 years. And then this year decided to really focus on leadership development for other companies. Took a little bit of a step back catch my breath a little bit before I gear up and probably do it all over again, because let's be honest, this is what we do to ourselves. Um, so I'm at winning by design now and building out their leadership practice because Pete, as you know, we talk about this often, right? Sales training is not where it needs to be in the industry right now. Sales leadership training is a joke. It's non-existent. And that is <laughs> tell me what you really think. They, like, dude, we're on the fire side, right? If we're going to talk around the fire, like we're going to talk about yeah. the fire. So right. That's, yeah. that's how I feel. That's what I'm doing now. And I'm enjoying it. That's awesome. And obviously everyone, you know, knows winning by designs, you know, exemplary uh, sales excellence consultancy uh, started by, by Jocko and Dominique. So absolutely fantastic. All right. Well, I'm pumped to, to talk more about our various uh, sales leadership topics here. Um, for folks who are interested, um, one of the things that we're um, offering folks, the Atrium uh, marketing team is offering folks is what we call a sales manager survival kit. So if you'd like to get a copy of Cracking the Sales Manager Codes, one of my favorite books on um, on data-driven sales management, it's like the Bible for, um, for sales metrics and how to apply them to SDRs, AEs, you know, AMCSMs. Um, we'd love to send you a copy, plus a little coffee is for coaches, Yeti uh, mug, plus a couple of um, metrics analysis, um, la- like desk references that we have. We're gonna drop the link in the chat here. Just go ahead and sign up for that. All we ask in exchange is a little, uh, little disco chat with our, um, with our team. Um, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and drop the, uh, that link there. So why don't we, um, why don't we get, started here um so so katie when like the the way that we kind of like framed this this fireside chat was that you know you're the you're the father of uh of modern sales management um when you think about like modern like modern sales management and how it's different than like maybe like old school sales management or sales leadership what are the biggest kind of like deltas that you see there between like the old way of doing it and like how the how the new way ought to be to be done so there's there's a few like like three things that i really think separate call it the old school or how even how it just used to be done whether it was old school or not it's just how it used to be done or how it's done outside the default into SaaS. one is like people focused Right. Historically, sales leadership did not care about the person. Right. Cared mm-hmm. about the numbers. Right. Mm-hmm. Are we hitting the numbers? We're not. You're out. Fire the bottom 20 percent is what it is. Keep your job. Like it wasn't focused on the person. And I feel like mm-hmm. that's the first shift in modern leadership is like understanding that the better the person is, mm-hmm. the better the results will be. Mm-hmm. Right. Because if we if you really break it down, when we hire people, when you hire people, we are hiring for who we want people to be. We want them to be confident, be resilient, to be gritty, be creative, be empathetic, be creative like that. We want them to be a certain type of person. But then when they get in their job, all we focus on what to do. Mm -hmm. And if we address the being, if I can help my team be more confident, the results Mm -hmm. will be there. If I can help my team be more motivated, the results will be there. So that's the first is like people focus and weaving that into like your leadership style and cadences on the person. Yeah. The, the second part of modern is process. Like it can't be the wild, wild west out there. Like, like six, six year olds playing soccer. Just oh, chasing no. the ball like everywhere. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, Pete's good. Everyone go do what Pete does. And then so people go to Pete and go, what do you do? And Pete says, I don't know. I'm just natural or I just work <laughs> harder. It's like there's no process to mm. this. Right. And making sure that in order to scale You cannot, this is one of the things, you know, winning by design talks about a lot. You can't scale superstars. Mm -mm. All right. Pete might be the best, but you can't build a team of the best. It doesn't work that way. You need to identify the behaviors that lead to it and then build processes around those behaviors. Right. Mm -hmm. So make it repeatable. So the process and the last part is data. We -hmm. finally have it. Like we have all the data we could possibly want in leadership and then some and yet we still sales historically was very gut based Mm -hmm. leadership was gut 
based, right? Like what's the feel on this deal? What's the feel on a territory? What's the feel on a person? The data is there for us. And it's actually still very shocking to me how little a lot of sales leadership actually Mm -hmm. one understands the data two even has access to it or three does anything about it. Right. So it's getting away from gut and more into data to make sure that you know what's causing the results and then you work backwards from there. So that's the shift to me. People, process, and metrics, that's modern to me compared to the old school way of doing things. Yeah, totally. And I, I think it's unsurprising to me. I always forget that you have a background in kinesthesiology and like coaching and whatever, because, you know, as I may not look at right now, but like back in the day, I was a competitive athlete. And I think that like a lot of folks really, um, you know, they, they underappreciate how like, it's really kind of mapped out for us in, you know, high end athletics, but even like collegiate or like high school or, or whatever. And like, we, we get into like professional land and all of a sudden it's like, you know, coaching is, is micromanagement. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, what do you, like, what do you want, man? Like Tom Brady comes off the sideline after a series, you know, after a, you know, a, a series and immediately, I guess not right now, you know, now it's on the bucks instead of the, the Patriots, yeah. but like goes over to Belichick or whatever. And like they immediately talk about like, just like what went down. It's like, is that micromanagement? Like not at all. Right. Oh. And, and I think that like, for, I want to talk a little bit about like where that resistance comes from um, maybe a little bit later, but like totally that I just actually dropped a, an article in the chat that I really like it's by Nate Silver uh it's called rich data poor data and what it talks about is um so Nate Silver is the guy who does you know 538 um Mm -hmm. like a polling thing but he also is like you know like a sports nerd um as well and what he talks about in it is like one of the precursors that is required in order to have like good metricality um is you actually have to have the data available. And so like baseball, and if I recall correctly, Katie, you were actually a baseball guy mm-hmm. by, by background. So the cool thing about baseball historically is that it had like a really amazing data set, right? Because like baseball is slow enough that um, like that you can like manually score it, right? So we have mm-hmm. like, you know, 100 plus years of like baseball history, 162 games a season, it's all scored out. And so it was like unsurprising that baseball was like one of the first places where data-driven management, um, you know, kind of coaching showed up. Even in the face of that, though, like, I'm sure everyone's, like, watched Moneyball or read the book or whatever. There was still a lot of resistance. So when you talk about people being resistant or, like, not used to it, 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 there's, like, a transition period, right? Because, like, not everybody's, like, you were primed to understand this stuff. Like, it's all, like... It's all it's all data and also trust the process, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like you've been primed for that for a long time. You know, you're fifty something, you know, sixty something uh, sales leaders who maybe like they came up in a data poor environment, like they don't have the muscles yet. Mm-hmm. And I think well, one of the things that we're seeing in Atrium is like like fo- the, the young folks, like I don't know if you and I count as young, but like you know a little bit younger than us, like they get it. Because they're like they're on their Strava, they've got sorry, they're on their Peloton, they got Strava, mm-hmm. they've got Apple Watch, et cetera, et cetera. So like they get it, but even kind of like the older folks are starting to come around now and be like, oh man, like yeah, I get the get the opportunity here. I got to get on this train. But the, I think the question is like, how do you enable them to do that? And I think that's like another kind of big topic, which is, you know, what do you think is is causing organizations to insufficiently invest in making these managers better at you know, better at leading, better at coaching, uh, et cetera. Like, where do you think the, the, the deficit comes from there? I mean, the, the first deficit comes because they didn't have to do it when they were reps. Mm-hmm. Right. It starts there. Right. For the most part, companies don't develop reps into top mm-hmm. performers. You luck into one and they're there. So because they didn't have to teach them how to be a great rep, mm-hmm. there is this assumption that I won't have to teach them how to be a great manager. Mm -hmm. And that's where the gap lies. And that would not fly in any other industry. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it does in sales. So the first, right, is like, like no one, no other industry would ever say that's okay. Like, hey, nurse, you've been a great nurse. Now you're a doctor. Yeah. Go figure out some doctor stuff. Like, no, they would put you back to school to go a achieve mm-hmm. that right like you're a surgeon's assistant and then become a cert like there's mm-hmm. for whatever reason in sales we throw people into the next role assuming because they were good at their last one they'll be good at this one and it doesn't work that way 
the other big reason behind this, I can't remember. It's some, it's some law. I can't remember what it was. It was like, you, you teach the way you were taught. Sure. You parent the way you were parented, right? Like, or you go the complete opposite, right? It's one mm-hmm. or the other. Who taught you how to be a great leader? Right. And because we weren't taught, we don't think to teach. Yeah. Yeah. I think that like, yeah, it's, it's almost, I think the, as you become a leader, um, and this is something that I've had to, I've struggled with a little bit when going, cause like we have, I think we have like 13 AEs right now at Atrium, 13 AEs and like eight SDRs or what have you. And um, there's in like the very beginning of a startup, um, there's like figuring out the sales motion, mm-hmm. which is very much about like the work and doing the work. Like you say these things in this order, this objection shows up, you answer it like this right here. Oh, they say this, you bring this slide up. Oh, that slide doesn't exist. We need to make that slide and put it into the deck and da, 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 da. So it's like the work. But then as you get, like, as you scale up, your work is actually about the people, which mm-hmm. I think was your your point number mm-hmm. one. And I talk about this with my, my team all the time, which is um, that like, we are in the people, like n- not just the the prospect, right? But we are in the people inspiration business or like, I, I call it like mind control, even though it's like not mind control. It's more just yeah. like, you know, funneling, right? Like motivation. I follow a bunch of coaches on, on Twitter in this regard, but it's like helping like, and so as soon as you kind of like change that mindset and, um, and say like, hey, you know what? Like I'm not in the business of, I'm not in the business of closing deals for my reps. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I will help them from a deal strategy standpoint when we're talking about deal, like, okay, like where are we at in this deal? Where are the risks, et cetera? Oh, did you think about this? Oh, I totally spaced on that. Like helping them navigate the like choose your own adventure novel of, of like their top five or top 10 or tw- mm-hmm. top 15 ops. That's important. But then the other thing though, is if you, if you see that they have a recurrent pathology in the way that they're working their deals or even better if like when you look at their metrics <laughs> rather than trying to figure out like by looking at all their little deals and like deriving and like an extension of their issue if you see what an issue is then you can coach that to resolution well now you just made that person like better mm-hmm. and so and like now they're they're being better will impact all of their deals or all of you know all of their prospecting or what have you but really just kind of like changing the mindset of the manager to be like hey your job really is to be like up leveling your 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 reps as much as possible like that is that's why you get paid the big bucks is a big is a big shift there I, what are some of the ways to kind of like emphasize that at, from a culture cultural standpoint because if it's a new muscle the same yeah. way that like we want to get the reps like into like, okay, cool. It's a new muscle to cold call. Like we got to like get the muscle memory going. So if, if coaching and, and management is a, is a new muscle, what are the things that we can do to ingrain that like muscle memory and just make it like, you know, breathing? Yeah. Well, it starts at the top, right? So mm-hmm. with, I, you know, I have man like my, my last team at its peak was just over 150, 160 reps, about 14, 15 managers, a couple directors there. And does that patient pop? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So was that like 80 sellers and like 40 SDRs or? So I had, no, I was about the, no, I was outside about 90 SDRs, Holy 50 mackerel. sellers, management director. And then I also had the enablement org that rolled okay. to me as, as well. So a lot of managers, right? A lot of managers, a mm. lot of managers, right? Yep. But here's the key though. Everything I expected my managers to do for their reps, I need to do for my managers. Mm-hmm. So, if my managers are supposed to be practicing with their reps, guess what I'm doing with my managers? Yes. If my managers are supposed to be doing call reviews with my reps, what am I doing for my managers? It's the same thing as you move up to build yeah, one layer up though. the skill set, right? Same idea. Once there was a layer between director to me to managers, what I'm doing with the director is the same thing I did for my managers. Until that skill set is ingrained, it's the same thing that you have to teach. So it starts at the top. So what were some of the behaviors there? Was it like role playing, having like a difficult conversation or doing like mock one on ones or like doing kind of like a like a mock QBR with a, you know, with a with a, like oh. I'm you with the yeah. manager. And then we look at a reps metrics and we tear it down and we talk about like and, and then we say we're doing like a lightweight QBR. Like what were some of the, the all, football, all, the football moves that you were practicing with them? All of it. Right. So nice. one, it started with documenting the wiggle. Right. So the acronym I use a lot, wiggle, W. G L L 
wiggle okay what good looks like mm-hmm. so that was documented first of all what Love good it. looks like what does a good one-on-one look like that is documented mm-hmm. what does a qbr look like that is documented right it's the three yeah. d's define document demonstrate mm-hmm. so for all of it right define demonstrate document for what good looks like right so it started there now I can hold them to that and I can actually teach them that of this is what good looks like. So one-on-ones for sure. Call coaching. Call coaching. Mm. Do we coach it the same way? If not, kind of a problem. But right. if I learn something new from another rep, we'll get into this a little bit as we go to the metrics, that updates the wiggle, which updates yep. the D3, which updates the training, right? Like it's all coming together through all of it. So one-on-ones, call reviews, tough conversations for sure interviewing how to fire somebody all of it we would work on together right to make sure that we knew how to do it so that that was the key but then again the documentation of all this is key when you joined as a manager on my team there were 14 hours of manager training videos that you went through over your first month how to run a one-on-one your first 30 60 90 how to leverage metrics. I would test you on this, right? I'd pull up a dashboard. Go, okay, Pete, what do you see? Right. What do you see? Where should we focus, right? That was how we structured those things to make sure that those skills were actually there. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, one of the things <clears throat> um, that I, so we have a, our, our new VP of sales, a woman named Melana Call. She's a former sales loft um, sales leader. And so she's actually from Chile. Uh, and so, you know, my Spanish is her- is terrible, but like I pretend that I like know some. Yeah. And so what we always talk about <clears throat> is how as you're scaling up, um, more and more of your job is to be a uh, bibliotecaria, which is a librarian. Right. And like and and it's you know, it's it's insufficient to like drop something ephemerally into Slack. It's insufficient to have um you know, just a conversation. Conversations are important because humans, you have to do both because <laughs> humans are, are, you know, suck at reading. And um, and so, what, but what you need is you need the documentation and to have a verbal conversation about it, which then points back to the documentation, which then of course is shared in a, in a follow-up email that memorializes the conversation with a hyperlink to the relevant documentation. But what it all kind of comes down to is that you should be doing your doing work, making sure that you're documenting these things. And, um, you know, anytime you say you see yourself saying something like more than twice, that probably indicates that there's a need for a document. Oh, God, yes. there. It, it's always right. Yeah. Like we, so we did. Um, so the leadership methodology that I taught my team was BPS, which is for behavior process skill. Right. Mm-hmm. What are the so if we're looking at close rate, what are the behaviors behind that? What's the process behind that? What's the skill behind it? But the process score was for us. It was a leadership score. Do we have a good process in place for this skill, for this behavior? Is it documented? Have we taught it? When's the last time we taught it? Is it recorded? Have we involved the reps in it? Like the process score was for us to go and mm-hmm. that that was where we'd own it <laughs> y'all what's fun about this anyone listen you could ping my managers you could ask them that they'll walk you through all of this two things that we did all all the time right if a manager ever came to me and was frustrated about a rep the first question i would ask them was have you coached them on it right exactly have you coached them on it now we had a very specific definition of coaching meaning done with feedback Mm-hmm. not told them, Hey Pete, I really need you to step your, your dials up this month, man. Mm. That's not coaching. That is not coaching. Doing with feedback would be coming up with the plan, getting feedback on that plan and then reinforcing. Have you coached them? How, right? Okay. Leaders talk about the, what good leaders get into the, why great leaders can help craft the, how, mm-hmm. how will we make more dials? So yeah, that was the first question have you coached mm-hmm. them? And so often it'd be like, Oh, no. All right. As you were. <laughs> you know, right. Yeah. You, sounds you like know, you have a, ta- sounds like you have a task. <laughs> right? Sounds like, you know what to do here. Right. Yeah. So like <laughs> that, that was, that was there. Like that was, that was part of it. Always, always have you coached them? Cause then if the answer is no, then we know we have a people problem, not a process problem. We can address it. Right. 
Yeah, exactly. It's just like I was having a Slack conversation with um with my my VP of sales about this this morning, where she was she was aggravated about something, and I and I was like, hey, like you know, where's the documentation? Where's the documentation on this? And like, is there space on the calendar to do this this behavior and so on and so forth? And um and I think that's like the process scoring right there. One of the other phrases or like kind of concepts that we use internally at Atrium is we refer to like our sales software. So not, not sales software like sales loft or like outreach or gong or atrium but we call it like the software that like runs our sales organization and um and which is usually like documents and slides and like recordings and so on and so forth and um anytime we run into an issue <clears throat> And, and invariably you're going to run into issues because like things are changing and you identify like a, you know, a boo-boo or whatever. Um, we update the software. Right. And so the way to like the easy way to do that, like we ran into something yesterday where there was like some hiccup in the way that people were like close losting things. So we have a document on the close losting process. Like got to do that. So one of the things is like really cool about Atrium is like, it's really quick to set up, it takes like five minutes. So we sell on customer data, but if someone doesn't buy, um, then we turn off their account, um, et cetera. And there's like a whole like, you know, process associated with that, that is separate than like from like the Salesforce cleanup or whatever. And there's a hiccup. There's like a hiccup in the, in, in the process there. And we recognize that. And all we had to do is like, just, we updated the document because the way that the AEs go about closed lossing is like, literally they just like, Oh, I got to close loss and off. They open up the closed loss check, you know, checklist right here. They have like Salesforce right here. They're just going down here. And so like the, if they hit the new step, that is like the updated software, like, boop, like they, they do it appropriately. And so we always refer to it internally, like, uh Oh, got to update the software. Uh Oh. Mm -hmm. And so I think holding managers um, accountable to making sure that that process is, is legit and like well scored is important <laughs> now, because I think th this is one of the things that junior managers really struggle with is like, they feel um, maybe not enabled or like scared or like bad about like, giving constructive criticism or kind of holding people accountable, what have you. If you're like, if you're like, if your game is tight as a manager, like if your process score is high um, and, and then moreover, like if you have data that you can bring to bear, then it actually helps managers be a lot, have a lot more backbone uh -huh. in having those conversations. Cause like, they don't feel like the heavy, like the big, bad, which, right coming it coming off the top rope there because they they have that so i think like making sure that your game is tight first um because then if your game is tight then there's really no reason why you shouldn't be like hey man like this is documented in the playbook and you completely ran that route wrong like what <laughs> what's going on it, right it, it takes the emotion out of it it takes the micromanagement yeah. out of it. it's like this is what good looks like we know this is what good looks like this is what we've agreed to do how can i help you do this better but also a big part of this was making sure that the what good looks like was proven not preference this was not just like oh well because i learned this 10 years ago that's what's in the playbook right so one of my favorite exercises that we ran that fed the what good looks like is once a quarter we did scaling greatness so um one of my favorite um books um around that actually truly actually in life is called the happiness advantage by sean acor um mm -hmm. Bought it for my whole team during COVID. Like it's one of my favorite books just around like mindset and happiness. But one of the things he talks about in that book is the cult of the average. Mm. Cult of the average. And that's that's stuck with me ever since. Mm -hmm. He's like, as a culture and oftentimes in business, right, we cater to the average. Yeah. How, can, how fast can the average child learn? What's the mm. average close rate? What's the average ACV? What's the average right sales cycle? And then we mm. cater to the average. And he's like, our real job in leadership in life is how do we change the average, not cater to it, right? Yeah. You move the whole fucking average up. Sorry, yeah. try not to cuss. Um, <laughs> do that by studying the positive outliers. So what my yeah. team would do is once a quarter, I assigned a metric to a manager. Pete, you have close rate, right? Jess, you have ACV. Jesse, you've got dials. Davion, you've got meeting show rate. And your job was to study the positive outliers. What do they do differently? What do they do? Because once we know what they do, that becomes the wiggle. That goes into D3. That sets up our training. And now we are just constantly evolving. I, I'll tell you, like Julia, I always tell Julia's story because this one always is top of mind. Julia had the highest ACV on the team. God bless. Love her. 
why why <laughs> right? just throw yeah. an extra just throw yeah. an extra seed in there just throw an extra seed in there you know what why? you guys are probably growing i i think it would be you know my recommendation would be no right what, what, why was it, it, what was her secret okay her secret which by the way even she didn't know this is why you that never happens so much performer what they so do much. differently they don't know Right. So we'd ask, like, what do you do? I'm like, oh, I just follow what, you know, KD taught. I'm like, oh, that feels good. But no, something's off here. Something's different. We mm -hmm. go in. Jess, Jess was who was assigned this metric. He goes in, listens to like seven or eight of her calls and goes, dude, I've got it. She presents pricing as a package, not as line items. Mm hmm. So it wasn't, okay, you'll get five seats for this and the onboarding for this and implementation for this. It was like, this good, is what best. you are paying. And I go, mm -hmm. I like that. So what do you think we went and did? Test it out. Try it. Like, it. You know. yep. Trained on it. And guess, yeah, guess who helped with the training? Julia helped with the training. So now you got the peer-to-peer -peer learning. We documented it and then built a process around it. We literally changed our quote process and our website pricing tool to cater to this process. And what do you think happened to ACV? It went up across the board. Yeah. Across the board, right? As opposed to catering to the average, we moved the average up. And that's how. That's why metrics are so important because it helps spot there's a behavioral difference, right? Yeah. Like this is like the whole is sales and numbers game or not. I always love that because people get like pick a side and they get argued and whatever. Sales, it's a numbers game. It is a numbers game. But behind every number is a behavior exactly. process or skill. Yeah, it's, just, it's an echo. That's the yeah. People get like upset about it because they think that it like minimize. It, it's just an echo. It's an echo of a behavior, exactly. right? Like like uh, what was it? Jesse's Jesse's high ACV was the result of some clever product marketing behavior that she was doing. It it like echoed like the high ASP there was an echo of that behavior. It right. then pointed us in the right direction to be like, what is going on over here? Right. And then this is one of the things that I tell my, my staff all the time is because AEs or SDRs or what have you, like, you know, if properly empowered, they're these clever little like they're always they should always be thinking like, oh, man, how can I get an incremental op in the door? Right? How can I you know, how can I pull this this deal across the line? How can I get this this um, how can I get this deal size? And then so they're always thinking in that regard. And then they come up with like a little innovation. Maybe the innovation doesn't work and it falls flat and that's OK. Like, you know, but if they if if they if they do figure out something um, oftentimes like they're not necessarily going to feel um, confident to be like, hey, everybody else should like do it this way. Or to your point about Jesse, like they may not even like, no, it's like Michael Jordan is like, I don't know. I'm just like amazing. Right. Um, like, I don't know what it is that, that makes me different. But as managers, what, this is actually one of the things that we talk about in Atrium um, is like the required capabilities as a manager. Yeah, you, sh you need to be doing like deal inspection and strategy, but there's a bunch of other things you need to be doing. You need to be like bringing data into your one-on-ones. You have to be like using data in order to diagnose issues like hitches yeah. in people's giddy up. But then in the Jesse case, you want to take what like the top performers are doing and then spread that across everybody else. And so the first step in doing that is like diagnosing the outliers like, whoa, your ASP is super high, WTF. Whoa, your close rate's bananas. WTF. Whoa, mm -hmm. like your, you know, your self-sourced op situation is amazing. WTF. And so yeah. if we didn't like refine all that and centralize it, then, you know, then, then super rad things, super rad things happen, happen there. I would, I would imagine that that also, because one of the things that, um, that I see in our customers um, is that oftentimes like managers are afraid to coach. It, there's, there's kind of the, like, mm -hmm. I'm not trained to do it, but then there's also like, I'm afraid to do it um and i would imagine in a situation in this case where like people see that it's like oh here comes kd the magical like sales um sales process fairy bringing me a gift of higher asp or higher close rate that probably changes the the calculus did that kind of help um systematize like a, a culture of teaching and, and coaching it it did and it didn't and and mm -hmm. here's what i mean there like if you want a certain behavior of your team, you make it a non-negotiable. Mm. So it wasn't, it wasn't, it, it was non-negotiable. It wasn't optional, right? It wasn't even something you could consider being on my team and not doing. Got and it. once that flag is staked, 
it changes things. Whereas when it's like you should be coaching or how much coaching are you doing? It's like, no, this is what we do. This is what it means to be a part of our team, right? So yeah. not the topic of today, but like we had our org virtues. So one of my favorite books on culture is What You Do Is Who You Are by um, yeah. Ben Horowitz. Yeah. And I, he broke this down, right? Values are what you believe. Virtues are how you behave. And Show we me. had our own virtues, right, on our org. Wait, you want me to wait? You actually want me to show you? I can pull these up. I love it. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll pull this up. Okay. But we had our own virtues. And because we had our virtues and again had clearly defined and documented what it meant to be a part of this team, it was built in, right? You define your culture and then you build it. You don't just let your culture happen by accident. So let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen here. Hold on. <laughs> it's the little uh it's the little arrow thing that's next to the camera. Oh, and, 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 yeah. It's not the most obvious thing in the world. You see I it? love yeah, hundred percent. All right. So this was right. Our vision, cultures and standards. Right. So we talk about this was my team vision to become the best sales team in the country, period. Our core purpose. Right. Improve and change the lives of our doctors and team. Right. So this sets the stage. Right. Our culture of excellence, ownership and execution. Right. But then we get here. If you don't set your virtues and cultures intentionally, they will happen by accident. And these were our virtues. Take care of the person, salesperson. Seek perpetual growth. Own your shit. Help YTP. ECM. Plan and play to win. Celebrate the process. Mm -hmm. And underneath that, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So when we say take care of the person, salesperson, here's what we mean. When we say seek perpetual growth, here's what we mean, right? Attending trainings, proactively look for ways to improve, right? Like all of this was documented. Right. And then what do you think was at the end here, my friend? Oh. <laughs> Accountability. I agree to not only uphold these standards from myself, but also hold my fellow team members accountable as well, right? So like the coaching was one built in. This is from day one. You know, this is how we operate, right? We know this is how we operate here. Then from there, that again comes from me. I'm coaching my managers. I'm coaching the reps. The reps see that. That's just built in to how we do things. That takes away the fear, right? Fear is like when it's optional. You don't know if you should or shouldn't. Right, right. Like, oh, uh, it's just like, no, that's what we do here. That's what are you what talking we, about? Like, that's just yeah. what we do. You know, like it, was, it wasn't a question that, but who establishes that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think that that ends up, yeah, and what we're talking about right now is 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 culture, but oftentimes what people do, a lot of times people like are very kind of confused as to like what culture means. And it's, the way that I kind of think about it is it's the operating system of, the, of an organization. And if you, if you leave it just kind of like amorphous, right, then bad things can happen. One is people don't necessarily know what they're signed up for. Um, two, they don't... Um, the enforcement mechanism can be problematic because it's like, oh, well, this is unstated. So am I being the heavy by saying like, hey, you didn't show up to this meeting. You're like, that's inappropriate. It's like, well, oh, is it right? Whereas it, in, in a situation like this, it's like, yes, it's these right here under like continuous improvement. Like you show up to trainings like I, I'm, I'm not making do. this up. That's what we do. Right. Like you know, we, there you can hire, fire and promote off your virtues. Right. I can hire people off of our virtues. This is how we behave. I don't know how many people we have listening right now. You saw one of my virtues, seek perpetual growth. What's an interview question I could ask to see if someone seeks perpetual growth? Right? I can hire against this now because it's been defined. I can fire against it. If you are not upholding our virtues, right? I saw a question come in to have them sign it. Yes, I have them sign it because I want to make sure there's a clear understanding of what it means to be a part of this team and also all of our promo tracks, right? So we have promo mm -hmm. tracks. They were metric and virtue based. Mm -hmm. so it didn't matter if you'd been blowing out your number for seven, eight months. If you weren't living up to the virtues, ECM, every conversation matters. Help YTP, help yourself, team and prospects. Seek perpetual growth. Celebrate. If you weren't living those, mm -hmm. you didn't get promoted. And that, again, came from the top of this is the line in the sand. And if you wanted to promote someone, guess what we did some back channeling on? 
have they been living the virtues virtues yeah yeah and i think that like because we're talking i don't know like um we are talking about making managers more successful at managing and and better coaches and and what have you but i think that there's like a flip side to this um which is um like how how staff receive coaching and are receptive to it and what have you and and it's a circularity right because like if you if you coach more like if you coach more and you do it in an appropriate fashion and you just make it frequent where it's like yes we do here right um and and you have it like as an example in your in your virtues there well then it then it's going to make it like the joke i always like to say is like you you know, you take your dog or your cat or your cat to the vet, even when they're not sick, because of that way, like they're just used to it. It's like, oh yeah, we're going mm-hmm. to the vet. That's what we do. We do it like, you know, we do this, we do this constantly. Um, but I, I do wonder what is driving a lot of like oftentimes resistance to, to coaching and, and feedback in the, you know, in the form of, of individual contributors. And then like, and then secondarily, what are kind of some mechanisms by which organizations and managers can, can approach, um, can approach like making, like breaking down that resistance. Like I'll, I'll kind of give an example here. What I kind of re- referred to it earlier, like here comes KD, like the sales motion fairy, bringing you like live and direct. Here's a better, mm-hmm. here's a way to like, win, or, like raise your win rates and like live and direct. Here's a way to raise your ASP. So it's like, oh it's a cookie right mm-hmm. like i can make myself um and so like then you're 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 bringing coaching in that way where it's like here's how to improve yourself um irrespective of like a specific like shortfall action like hey you, you know you might like let's go ahead and listen to the way that you handled that objection right there because you know it wasn't as good as it as it could have been mm-hmm. let's let's go ahead and talk through about it but by virtue of the fact that like it's just a muscle like constant coaching mm-hmm. um then people are like oh okay cool like this is constructive criticism here that just mm-hmm. kind of goes along with this other stuff as well what like uh, how do you kind of a- a- attack that mm-hmm. kind of like resistance to 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 like constructive feedback and and kind of coaching mm-hmm where people are like, oh, I feel like I'm being micromanaged right now versus like, I feel like I'm being coached to make myself, you know, to be better. So the, the first part of that, right, is just connecting it back to the why, right? So the what, mm-hmm. what we need to do, improve your close rate. That's what based leadership, that anyone can do that. The good, right, got into the why. Here's why, Pete. If your close rate's 17%, you're going to have to run twice as many demos per month to get to your Goal. You told me that you want to make 150K this year. In order to do that, by the way, I have all their goals too, so we can connect it back to their goals. We need to improve our close rate to get you on track for what you want to be hitting, your career path, your money. Here's what we've identified, and here's how we can improve that close rate. That's the other part is most managers are trying to coach on too much I drilled mm-hmm. my managers down one metric. What is the number mm-hmm. one metric per rep and what are you doing about it? That's what they reported up to me. But then that's also how they communicated with their reps. So I had a metric calculator very similar to like what Atrium does. Guess where that lived? On the rep one-on-one doc. The reps, yeah, exactly. put, in, the reps put in their metrics. The reps identified what's the number one metric holding me back. So I'm shifting that whole onus over of like Mm. the rep is responsible for identifying where they need coaching and generally speaking the answer that can never be nowhere unless what (laughs) what's the only time a rep could say honestly i don't think i need much coaching right now i i I have i I honestly can't think of a scenario in which like there isn't an incremental improvement area where they're leaving the organization i don't know like no like and i was very if you're blowing out your number and you mm-hmm. feel good about what you're doing and you're consistent, I'm okay with that. Like, mm-hmm. I'm all right with that. But until you're there, <laughs> you're getting coached, right? So again, we shifted yeah, the yeah. onus of who was supporting the coach, who I was identifying it. We moved that to be both people, the manager and the rep. And that was there. But then again, full circle back, and this is cultural. If I heard from a manager that a rep was uncoachable, how do you think that conversation went? Yeah, I can imagine that was probably 
pretty tough, especially given the fact that like they had signed the you know the right. the virtues plan and and or sorry the virtues document so, and and what have you. Is the last point I'll give though a reason why most reps do hate coaching because it's all negative. I will throw mm. this out. It's all yep. constructive criticism. If you want to change behavior, you need to positively recognize the behaviors you want to see. Right. Totes. That's why. That's why one of our virtue was celebrate the process. Mm -hmm. Right. So when I hear the good, I'm recognizing the good. Mm -hmm. When we practice, this is another place where a lot of reps don't like practice or role plays because of how they're run. Right. Mm -hmm. Where I go in, I get beat up for 30 minutes, and then I'm sent on my way. Yeah. Where we chunked our practice. Hey, so Petit, Pete, today we're working on second level pain questions, right? Now we're just going back and forth for 10, 15 minutes. By the end of those 15 minutes, though, you are nailing these questions. Mm -hmm. So what sort of feedback are you leaving with? Man, Good. like, yeah, I, I, put the, I put the bat on the ball. Great. I'm right. walking out of here like super pumped. I can't wait for my next, my next disco call. I'm going to crush it. Right. It's like, hey, Pete, you nailed it. Let's get one more in here. Oh, that was perfect. Okay, actually, let's tweak our tone just a little bit. Let's get one more. Da -da -da. Like Just like sports, right? You get that repetition. But now I'm positively recognizing you in a coaching session versus just beating you up in a coaching session. That also changes the landscape of how reps receive coaching. Yeah, 100%. And I think one of the ways that like we try to formalize <clears throat> or formalize an informal version of this is just having a culture of like kudos. Mm -hmm. Um uh, we like we have a Slack channel at Atrium um, just called Kudos, and and people drop you know any sort of example of like excellence goes mm -hmm. in there. Um, like it could be someone like crushing a talk track or whatever, right? And like you drop that into Kudos, like hey, like this objection handle is absolutely fantastic, or it could be a really great email, or just like hey, here's a screenshot of of this email right here. This is like absolutely fantastic, or you know, fill in the blank or, or what have you. And, and so then what people see is like, see, you know, positivity mm -hmm. there. Um, w one of the things that I t like to, uh, a, a metaphor that I like people to kind of think about when, when, when doing management is like um, deposits and withdrawals, mm -hmm. kind of like a, a piggy bank. And when you, when you deploy constructive criticism, which is important, right. From a growth standpoint, you know, it, it can be cognitively uh, taxing for the for the rep who's who's receiving it. It's important, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what we need to remember to do is to then like put the you know put the deposits back in there as well, right? And like put a couple deposits in, and then like pull out the you know uh, pull out the withdrawal. If you need to withdraw, maybe like kind of consider like take a hot second and be like cool where am i at on my balance of like mm -hmm. of of deposits and withdrawals maybe i mean need, need to make a couple like deposits first maybe i can put a pin in this this withdrawal um until tomorrow until the day after that um what have you just to make sure that you don't have a situation where people are kind of like shutting shutting down because then what people like then it just becomes like yeah that's what we do it's like we just do con like we're just doing continuous improvement here some of it's constructive but i know that when i do something great i'm going to get recognized not just like hey here's a fist bump at a boy at a girl mm -hmm. to you but then also publicly as well like hey i just heard so and so really crush this and like here's the chorus clip associated with it and all the, we had something very similar. We just always attached it to a virtue as well. Mm. So like, okay, dude, listen to this call that Pete dropped today. This is every conversation matters at its mm. just peak. He nailed every, like, so we would attach it to a virtue as well to mm -hmm. keep reinforcing the virtues that we are looking for. But yeah, I love that deposit and withdrawal. Just people listening, make sure you're not just staying at zero. Give them a surplus, like let them feel rich in love. So when you make the withdrawals, it's not nearly as painful. A $10 withdrawal hurts when you only got 20 bucks in the bank. A $10 right. withdrawal does not hurt if you got a thousand bucks in the bank. Make sure there's a surplus there. Yeah. And I think one of the things that folks oftentimes um, don't consider is that, um, you know, as long as it's not bullshit, um, you know, praise praise that is real mm -hmm. um is is not costly um and like hey this this is um you know like man that was a really great xyz right there hey that 
and now one of the things that you but again it, it has to be real yeah. right um one of the things that we talk about in our organization is like you don't get praised for breathing um <laughs> it's kind of hey good job katie like um your your autonomous ner- uh, nervous system is working yay yeah. <laughs> right like it's it, it can't be that because then that like lowers the bar but when but when you do see instances of of like you know bright sparks there and i that's why i really appreciate the connecting it to the um to the virtues call it out call Mm -hmm. it out right um and just like as a manager if you can just get in that habit um (laughs) one thing you have to be careful about is oftentimes um oftentimes you're you're like your top performers are going to be the ones who are the you know the constant examples here so you just to be a little careful there like when you're making those like public like when you're making those deposits and you're making kind of like the the public deposits you have to kind of like round robin it some mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it's the like, recognition is not used enough in terms of leadership and and management you need to recognize any behavior that you want to see continue and it can. I, I know the example of like recognizing for breathing. I know that's the extreme and that's not what I'm saying. But damn it, y'all, if someone is doing what you want them to do, recognize them for it. It doesn't always have to be special, right? Because like that's why, again, that virtue celebrate the process was so important was because more often than not, we only celebrate the result. Mm-hmm. Pete closed this deal. KD hit quota. It's always about the result. Where is the pre- precursors? What's leading to it and celebrating that managers give more of it out. It's one of the easiest things you can do to change the culture of an org is positively recognize the behaviors that you're looking for. Right. Yeah. And even if it doesn't feel big, even if you're like, well, that's their fucking job, KD, they should be doing it. Yeah, they should. Right. Recognize them for it because that's what you should be doing. And I will draw that line. As a leader, you should be recognizing your team for the things they're doing well, even if that is just their job. Yeah, even and I think one of the things, unfortunately, we don't have time for it, but like I'm a big fan of like I think the next step in enablement and coaching is like so there's first just like making coaching a habit, making feedback a habit, like kind of what we're talking about next is like doing it org wide. And then the next level after that is individually based, right? Which of course in, you know, in athletics, we're super familiar with that. We're just like, okay, cool. Like the thing we're working on with you is like, we're trying to keep, you know, we're trying to make your hands fast to the ball. You were trying to keep your head down. You were doing X, Y, Z. And so when you are doing those individualized coaching plans, not everybody is like hitting the cover off the ball. And so when you have the folks who are not the, you know, kind of like in the middle of the pack and we're trying to improve them, giving recognition around that improvement, right? Even if they're not at the level of other folks can be very po- powerful as well. Again, not just for them, but then publicly as well. So everyone's like, hey, look, our leaders are here in the business of making everyone better even the folks that are in the middle of the pack, like what we do is we celebrate incrementalism, you know, every day. Yeah. Every day, you know, 1% better here because not only for the folks in the middle of the pack, but also the folks who are like, you know, upper parts of the pack and, and what have you. And so like, you just through this kind of like process, like you're just putting it in the water and then, you know, over time, what ends up happening is you're like, Oh, like that resistance drops, you end up with like a learning culture, you end up with a coaching culture and, um, you know, and, and good things kind of come out of that. Um, kind of like parting shots here when, um, you know, it, we probably have a bunch of managers like SDR managers, AE managers that are listening in right now. What would you, what would be like the first step, like the first easiest step that you would recommend um, to folks to just like, you know, what's the first thing they can do on, to start on a, on a journey to, uh, to getting better? Mm-hmm. Learn your people's goals. That's where, I, that's where it starts. What do your people want to accomplish personally and professionally? Because that's what you'll be tying coaching back to every single time. Right? So knowing where they are trying to go and grow, how much they want to make, what they want to do in their career, and what that will allow them to do outside of work that's what we're going to be tying coaching back to. I'm not talking to Pete about hitting quota, I'm talking to Pete about making the money he wants to make so he can get the car he wants to drive or take the mm-hmm. vacation he wants to take. 
That's why we're about to practice objection handling. So that's where I'd recommend starting. If you don't know the goals of your people, it's going to be very challenging to ask them to change anything. I love it. Excellent. Well, Killer, KD, thank you for uh, taking the time today. Um, just kind of parting shots for folks. If you'd like to get a copy of Cracking the Sales Management Code, uh, I, Coffees for Coaches, Yeti, and, and some metrics, uh, def, desk references, please go ahead and just sign up with the link that we're going to share here in a second. Everybody, thank you for joining us, KD. Thanks for taking the time. I hope you have an absolutely fantastic weekend. Uh, Hannah, anything else we need to cover? No, just wanted to say thanks for everyone to attending. Katie, you were amazing. Pete, thank you for moderating. And link is in the chat for that survival kit. So thanks, everyone. See you soon.